Today we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion. If you are worshiping online, please take this time to gather bread or cracker plus juice, wine, or water. If you have prayer concerns you would like to have shared during our morning prayer time, please submit a prayer request form which is available with this morning's worship bulletin. If you have prayer concerns and you are watching us online, please type those into the chat section. Please type your prayer concerns in early enough during the service so we have time to transfer those to our pastor. St. John's Food Pantry continues to experience a decrease in the variety of food available from the Dayton Food Bank. The top items needed at the present time are as follows. Personal items, including facial soap, hand soap, laundry detergent, toilet paper, paper towels, deodorant, shampoo and conditioner, and toothpaste. And grocery items, including pancake mix and syrup, cake mix, jelly, spaghetti sauce, canned goods, for example, baked beans, ravioli, and tomato and chicken noodle soups, and pet food. We appreciate any help you can give by bringing in any of the aforementioned items. Thank you for helping us continue to help others. St. John's website at www.stjohnsucc.org is updated weekly with our upcoming events, bulletins, weekly newsletter, and links to our Sunday live stream videos. Please visit us for the latest information regarding church and early learning center activities. Good morning. Good morning. Happy, Easter. Happy Easter. Let's see what we remember from last year. Christ is risen. Christ is risen All right, that's pretty good. All right. Welcome everyone to St. John's United Church of Christ here in Germantown, Ohio. All of you who are with us today here in the sanctuary, all of you who are watching or will be watching from home. Uh, it's wonderful to be together. It's great to have this opportunity to celebrate and think about the resurrection and what it means in our lives. Uh, I want to just mention that in your bulletins, there are a couple of inserts. One is for the food pantry we just heard about. You can take that home. The idea is, you know, put that up on a magnet on the refrigerator or somewhere in the kitchen. So when you do your grocery list for the week, you might add one or two items for the food pantry from there. And also, there is an insert for all the beautiful Easter flowers that we have, um, letting us know who they're in memory of, who they're honoring. Um, thank you to all of you who participate in providing these flowers for our Easter celebration. As we do every week, let us begin by offering to one another in a way that we're comfortable with the peace of Christ.
Join me, stand if you're able, for the call to worship, printed in your bulletin and on our screens. Christ is risen from the dead, bestowing life upon those in the tombs and the grip of death. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please join in singing Christ the Lord is Risen Today. That's in our red hymnal, number 216, and we will be singing verses 1 through 4.
Let us pray. Eternal, gracious God, through Christ, you raise life from the dead, hope from despair, and freedom from fear. The night is over, the dawn appears. May love light our way to your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated.
Thank you. All right, kids, come on up if you want. If not, we can slice a couple minutes off of this thing. So, what's different about today from other Sundays? Look around you. <laughs> right? Sesame Street, they ask, right? They ask, which of these things doesn't belong? Okay, look around. What doesn't usually here on a Sunday? Don't say this many people. <laughs> right? There are flowers. Right? There's flowers all around you. And look at you. I mean, you're always a good-looking crowd, but you're dressed up nice. You did. You look good. Why? Why today? Yes. Because it's Easter. Why is Easter so important? Do you know why? Yes. Why? Right, because the Easter Bunny comes, right? Why, though, does the Easter Bunny come? Why, why? Do you know why? What's, what's the Easter Bunny celebrating when he brings eggs and candy to us? Do you know? Right, he brings chocolate, but why does he bring, do you know? Go ahead. Because it's a special holiday. It's your favorite holiday. The reason why today is so special, why you're dressed up nice, and why we have all these flowers, and why the Easter Bunny goes through all of the work to get that candy together and get to your houses, is because this day we remember something that is incredibly wonderful, and that is that Jesus came back to life and is still alive. And Jesus is with us, right? Jesus is part of us, and we are grateful for that because Jesus being alive changes everything. It makes everything better. 
And so we put on our fancy clothes and we fill the room with flowers and we have nice dinners and we visit with family because this is something to celebrate. Jesus did not just go away. Jesus is here now alive with all of us. So enjoy your Easter. Enjoy your candy. All right? I, Easter Bunny doesn't come to my house anymore because we don't have any little kids, but I took care of that yesterday. I went out and bought candy for myself. <laughs> hey, brother. All right. Enjoy it. Have a good time. Here we go. All right. And remember that Jesus is alive, and we can be so happy about that. Now, get your candle. If you're going to godly play, head on out, and we'll see you later. Okay? All right. You got the candle. Thank you, brother. I have two readings this morning. The first one is from Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley that was full of bones. I was led all around them, and there were very many bones lying in the valley, and they were very dry. The Lord said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, Lord God, only you know. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will lay sinews on you and I will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I, as I prophesied, suddenly there was a rattling, and the bones came together, and I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then the Lord said to me, Prophesy to the breath, mortal, and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as I had been commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then the Lord said to me, Mortal, these bones are the entire house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Our New Testament scripture is from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a person, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a person. For as all die in Adam, so we will be made alive in Christ. 
but each in its own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when Christ hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after every ruler and every authority and power has been destroyed. For Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. Our gospel reading today is from the gospel attributed to Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us? <clears throat> from the entrance to the tomb. When they looked up, they saw that the very large stone already had been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Going out, they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. So when my, uh, my eldest, my son Ben, was about four or five, we, uh, we decided to take him to the movies, go to the theater. Now, we were rookie parents, so the first mistake we made was we put him, we let him sit on the aisle seat and not in between us. We learned that lesson. But we went to see Jungle Book, the Walt Disney cartoon version. And there's the point in, I don't think this is a spoiler alert for anyone, uh, there's a point in where the bear, Baloo, that he really liked, right? Where the bear, Baloo, seems to die. And we didn't anticipate this at all. But as soon as that happens, Ben screams out, No! And he gets up and he runs up the aisle out into the lobby. And so I'm chasing him out. Chasing him down and get him and calm him down and tell him it's okay. He's not really dead. And got him back into the theater. I thought of that reading this gospel, you know, reading, preparing this gospel story. It's like the women who have come to the tomb just have finally broken. See, the thing about Mark's gospel, as we've talked about, is there's this Narrowing. We talked about this last week, right? Where everybody abandons him. Everybody but the women. All the male disciples run away and hide. Judas betrays him. Peter denies him. But the women, the gospel says, they stand afar. They stand apart. They're not idiots. They're not going to walk right up into the middle of a Roman execution. But they stand aside. They stand away and they watch. 
And then when the body's taken down and it's buried, they go and they see, they watch from afar where it's buried. And then they prepare that the, as soon as they can, the first day of the week, when the Sabbath is over, they're going to go and they're going to do the, the burial rites for him that couldn't be done on Friday. The women have hung on. They have been faithful right up to the point that they walk up and they find the tomb open and there is this young man there who says, he's not here. They weren't prepared for that. And of course in Mark's gospel, they should have been. That's one of the things about Mark's gospel. He tells, in the gospel, Jesus tells them over and over and over again, I'm going to be killed, but then I'm going to rise. They never seem to hear that. What's interesting about the women in this scene, I think, is they were willing to stand with him through his life, through his death, through his burial, because they understood those things. They knew that people lived and died and were buried, and they knew what to do, right? When somebody dies in our life, they, you know, often we, we kick in to a certain mental mode, right? We know what to do. We know to contact the family. We know to set up a meal train. We, we, we know what we're supposed to do. And they were doing all the things that they were supposed to do. And they were happy to do it. But they get there and there's no body. They get there and something has happened that they cannot have anticipated. They never really believed. See, that's the thing. They could really believe that he would be killed. But they couldn't really believe that he would rise. Because it wasn't in their experience. And so what did they do? They, they, like my little Ben, they see it and it's just too much. Mark says they run, they flee from the tomb. They're terrified. They're bewildered. And in the actual, you know, in the, in the actual text, you know, the way it's written is, and they said to no one nothing. That double negative in, in the original language is meant to emphasize they didn't say anything at all to anyone about anything because they were afraid. Now, you may wonder, where's the rest of the story? Because we know how the story goes, right? Look at our back window, the beautiful window, which is based on Matthew's version. There are earthquakes, and there's lightning, and there's angels, and there's Jesus. In Matthew, and in Luke, and in John, after the, the open tomb, the empty tomb, there's Jesus. He appears to Mary Magdalene. He appears to the two disciples walking to Emmaus. He appears to all the apostles in the upper room. Paul tells us in the first letter to Corinthians, he has a list of all the different appearances that he knew about of Jesus. Jesus appeared to Peter. Jesus appeared to the Twelve. Jesus appeared to James, the brother of Jesus. He appeared to 500 people at once. And I wish we had a narration of that story. The early church believed in the resurrection because they had seen him. They had heard him. They experienced him as alive. Mark doesn't give us that because Mark is a curmudgeon. Mark is, you know, he just can't play well with others, in a sense. He was the first one to write a gospel. His gospel was the first time we hear about the empty tomb. Paul never mentions the empty tomb. He talks all the time about the death and resurrection of Jesus and about seeing him. He never says, oh, and by the way, you know when the, when the tomb was empty, the body was gone. He never says that. 
because the empty tomb was not important to the early Christians as a proof of the resurrection. The appearances were. So what is Mark doing here? Because this is where it ends. Now, that didn't sit well with a lot of people, and so in the ensuing next few centuries, people tried to write their own endings to Mark's gospel to correct it. If you look in your Bible, there's a shorter ending, there's a longer ending, there's different versions of the longer ending. Because people didn't want it to end here. They wanted to see him. They wanted the Easter story that they knew. And since his gospel was used by Matthew and Luke and John to write theirs, they all thought, we need something else here. We need to confirm in our story that he was risen. Mark didn't have that need. See, it's not that Mark didn't know about the resurrection or didn't believe in the resurrection. Of course he did. And so did his community, the Christian community, probably in Rome. They knew about it. He's writing 40 years after the fact. He knows that the women didn't really run away and say absolutely nothing, that no one ever knew about the, the resurrection. He's not suggesting that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus went off to Galilee and was like, where is everyone? He knew, Mark knew, that the disciples and the apostles, they had come around, they saw him, they, they went from fear and doubt and denial to faith. He knew that. He just didn't see any particular need, apparently, to go over that whole story again. Because he was more interested in something else. So he has this open tomb with no body in it. And those two groups of people, the women, the faithful ones who in the last moment break, they break and they run. And there is then this young man. Now, people tend to think that this young man is supposed to be an angel. Matthew did, all the others do. They kind of say, oh, well, it's an angel who came. Mark knew the word for angel. He used it a lot in his Gospels. He did, if he wanted us to think it was an angel, he would have said it was an angel. This young man... That, that word is only used one other time in Mark's gospel. During the arrest of Jesus, last week, if you remember when we read the Passion, there's that strange little story about when Jesus is arrested and all the disciples scatter and run, that they says that there was one young man wearing just a linen cloth who was following Jesus, but then the mob turns to seize him, and it says... He slipped out of his garment and he ran away naked into the night. Scholars love to debate who this naked young man was, right? There's a certain uh, sensationality to it, sensation to it. But this same young man is who appears at, at the tomb, now dressed in a white robe which was the, the clothing that was used to symbolize someone who was a Christian, who, someone who was a part of the church. This young man, what Mark is saying is, the young man who ran away naked into the night because he was so afraid, now shows up at the tomb and he believes. He's the one who's there so that when people come to the tomb, he can say, you're looking for Jesus as a corpse, he's not here. He's risen. He's gone to Galilee, just like he said he would, which he does in Mark's gospel. Jesus says to the disciples, when I'm raised, I'm going to go ahead to Galilee with you. The young man is there to be the voice of someone who had denied Jesus, but now had come to faith. And he says to the women, go and tell the disciples. Notice this in the reading. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. Peter isn't considered one of the disciples at that point. Peter 
had cursed and swore that he never heard of Jesus. It's hard for us to imagine, right? St. Peter. But what Mark is saying, Peter was done. He was out of the circle. But the young man says, go and even find him and bring them back. For Mark, it's important that nobody comes out of his gospel a hero other than Jesus. Because all of us fail. All of us fall. All of us lose our faith in one way or another, at one point or another. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. All the rest of them ran for the hills. Even the women could not take that last revelation that he was alive. Because we say we believe in happy endings. Right? We say, oh yes. We believe that God will take care of us. But in Mark's experience, what we say and what we do is so often different. Mark wrote his gospel in Rome four or five years after the horrible persecution of the Christian community by the Emperor Nero. And we know that during that persecution, what, Ro what Nero and the Roman authorities did is they went to the people that they knew were leaders in of, of the Christian community, and they said to them, like tyrants and oppressors always do, give us the names of the others, and we'll go soft on you. So why Peter dies in Rome during that persecution, and Paul dies in Rome during that persecution, because they were prominent. They were easy to find. But the others, the authorities said, tell us. Deny it yourself, and we'll let you live. And we know that what happened is that some of the Christians buckled, and they gave up names, and they denied it. And then the persecution passes. And then they want to come back. This was a huge issue in that early church. What do you do with people who under pressure deny Christ and then want to come back? And in the scriptures, there's different points of view on that. The letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament, the author of that says, if you're a Christian and you deny Christ, you're out. And there's nothing you can do about it. But Mark, who lived through it, seems to have a different point of view. Mark's point of view is, we all fail. We all fall short. You see, the women could believe everything except the really good news. They couldn't believe the resurrection because it was too good to be true. They didn't know what to do with it. It was going to upend their entire lives. If they believed Jesus was risen from the dead, everything had to change. And most people don't want to have everything in their lives changed, even for good. And so we say, yes, but. People have a hard time believing that God really is in control of the world because they look around at the world. Ezekiel, the prophet, He'd been sent into exile. His, his country, the kingdom of Judah, the last Israelite kingdom, had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Jerusalem had been burned to the ground. Solomon's temple that had stood for centuries was, was destroyed. And he and the people of Israel at that point were saying, who are we? 
we have no future. That's what he's, you know, we're like a bunch of dry bones scattered across the valley. We're dead. We're done. And when God says to Ezekiel, can these bones ever rise? What does he say? Oh, yes, Lord. He says, I, I don't know. I don't know. So God in the vision says, you prophesy to them. You preach to them. You send my spirit back into them. Because they are going to come back alive. Your nation is not dead. Your people are not gone forever. And so we have this really weird image in Ezekiel here that we heard about where these bones, you can you know, start bouncing around on the ground and then they start scooting around and then they start hooking up to one another. You know that old song? Foot bone connected to the ankle bone. That's where that comes from. And he's like watching these skeletons form and then ligaments start appearing on them and then muscles and skin. I mean, it's kind of weird. But in the end, they stand back up and God says, Israel is not done. My people are not gone. I will do this. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that portion we just read, it looks ahead, again, to something that is, we can't even really wrap our heads around. What Paul is saying is that in the end, everything that is opposed to God will be brought under God's control, under God's sovereignty. It's what Jesus preached about repeatedly. The reign of God is here. It's coming. And Paul says it will, in the end, at some, in some way, everything, even death, will finally be put under the feet of Christ. But then the most amazing thing is, Paul says, and you know, at that point, even Christ will submit back to God everything, and that all there will be is God. Now, there's some mystical stuff for you on a Sunday morning. We don't know what that means other than God does not fail us. God did not fail Jesus because Jesus died. God does not fail us because bad things happen to us. Can we please, please reach the point in our lives where we stop thinking that God punishes us because we've done something he doesn't like? The pain and the struggle of our lives we have because we live in a world that is imperfect. But God is there. God is, God is telling us the tomb is empty because something new has started. And we can be like the women. We can say, you know, no, no, no. I'm comfortable with things the way they are. I'm comfortable with my church and my country, and my life, and my family, within the parameters I know, don't ask me to break down the barriers and start over. But God is saying we have to. Jesus rose from the dead so that we can rise from the dead. And we look around, and we see our world, and we don't see it. We could all make our own list of things in this world, in our lives, that are bad, that are horrible, that hurt. And we can say, don't we? The world's going to hell. But the fact of the matter is it's not. The world's not going to hell. The world's going to heaven. That's already been established. So the resurrection is about us in our bones having the power and the life of Christ. You know, there's that saying that people throw around as a joke. Not today, Satan. 
Well, that's the point of today. Not today and not ever again. So we have Mark's empty tomb as a challenge. Do we really want to embrace the unexpectedness of life? Do we really want to embrace this idea that life is something now entirely different and anything is possible? Or do we want to run away afraid because all we wanted to do was anoint the body? We didn't ask for the rest of this. That's the challenge of Easter. That's the challenge of Ezekiel, to say, I see no way out of this for us. But God says there is one, so okay. And in our illnesses and in our family strife and in our national mess and everything else, it's easy to say, I see no way out of this. So I'm just going to run away and live my life as best I can. Or do we say, God has promised because Christ lives that there is going to be a way through this. And we're going to be a part of it. I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to say when I fail that I am sorry. I am going to pick myself up and I am going to do better. Are we going to be, as St. Augustine said, Easter people? Or are we going to be Good Friday people? Today, we proclaim that we are Easter people. Christ is alive. We won. Everyone won. The only ones who lose are, as Paul says, the powers and the principalities of the world who would oppress us. The only one who ultimately loses is death. Because either life wins or death wins. And if we're here today, we have chosen to believe that life wins. So, happy Easter. We're going to face that open tomb over and over again in our lives. Let's do our best, not to run away in terror when we see it. But if we do, let us remember that Christ still calls us to be with him. He even forgave Peter. Amen. My friends, please stand as you're comfortably able and join in our hymn, The Strife is O'er, in the red hymnal 221, verses 1 to 3.
time for the offertory. I want to, as we try to do every week, want to thank all of you for all that you do here, for all that you contribute to make it possible for us to continue to preach the gospel. We're going to have the ushers pass um, the plates now uh, for the offertory. My friends, we begin now our communion rite. Let us begin with our opening prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift your hearts to God. Holy mystery, who is perfect love, you are beyond our knowledge or description. God of all time and space, source of life, you are forever creating new wonders throughout this ever-expanding universe. Nothing exists that does not find its source in you. Today, we gather in wonder at the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grip of death into the power and glory of new life. Through fear-filled days and aching nights, when the powers of death did their worst, your love never deserted us. Even when we turn away from you, you are with us. Your presence never fails us, and your gifts of forgiveness and liberation transform us. We praise you for Jesus Christ, risen to life, eternal as your love. We raise the strain of gladness. Alleluia! Life is stronger than death. The day of resurrection has come, scattering fear and gloom. And so we rejoice with all your people of every time and place. Jesus, the child of heaven and earth, the risen Christ, gathers us together as a community of broken but hopeful believers, loving what he loved, living what he taught, and striving to be his faithful people. In this meal, we remember Jesus, his promises, and the price he paid for who he was, what he said, and what he did. The night before Jesus died, he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Whenever you do this, remember me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, and said, Take and drink. This is my blood poured out as a new covenant. Whenever you do this, remember me. 
we remember. We remember his life of love, his teaching, his dying, and his rising to life again. In sharing this meal, we live out the mystery of our faith. Holy Spirit of God, we call on you to transform these gifts of the earth as you continually transform the world around us. Bless this bread and this cup, the wheat and the grape, the farmer and the harvest, the seed and the sower. In sharing these simple elements, we may taste and see your goodness. In this holy communion with you, may we find strength for the journey, forgiveness for our failings, comfort in our troubles, and healing in our bodies, minds, and spirits. May our world find a way to end violence, terrorism, greed, hate, and oppression. May all your children, without exception, find in us love, compassion, and acceptance. May we work diligently toward the day when all have food, water, housing, and can live in safety. Move upon this world with your divine presence and end war forever. We pray today especially for those within our own family of faith. We pray for Aaron, who is in the hospital as of this morning, having tests being done. We pray for Doris Hensley, who fell at home but is recuperating. We pray for our brother Roger, who continues to move forward in his cancer treatments. We pray for all those who are ill, who are suffering, who are alone, and who are afraid. For all that is, for all life, for love that is the foundation of the world, for the gift of Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit, we thank you and bless you, holy and gracious God, today and for all days to come. Amen. My friends, this is the body of Christ given up for us that we might live. This is the cup of blessing, the beginning of the new covenant that never ends. For communion, everyone is welcome. Doesn't matter if you're a member or not. Doesn't matter if you're baptized or not. Doesn't matter if you think you're worthy of it or not. Come forward and join in this table. All are welcome because it is Christ's table. It's not mine and it's not even yours. It is Christ's. So please come forward and join in this sacrament. Will those who are going to be helping come forward, please? And if you're unable to come forward comfortably, we will come to you.
Let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. <coughs> we thank you, God, for bringing us to this table. And sisters and brothers, may this bread and cup we have shared strengthen our love for you and for one another. Amen. My friends, please stand as you're comfortably able to do so and join in our closing hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, in the Red Hymnal 234, verses 1 through 2. It was wonderful to be together today, and for all those who are watching, we're so glad you joined us. Christ is risen. risen Let us go, (coughs) excuse me, let us go forth this week, living in that life as well as we can, and with the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.